Come, come, whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come, 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 whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come, once more, come, come, whoever you are, wonder, worshiper, lover of leaving, ours is no caravan of despair. Come, yet again, come. Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. Welcome to one and all. I want to begin, as always, by welcoming all that you bring with you today, all of your uniqueness, your unique beliefs, your unique background, your unique lifestyle, and your unique mask. I see lots of them out there. This, this, yes, I like your mask. That's a great mask. And this is so for those who are sitting in the room with mask on, and those of you who are streaming with us, I'm guessing maybe you're someplace you don't have to wear a mask, but it's great to have all of you here today. So thanks for being here. Um, Maybe those of you who are at home streaming have taken a little break from some big game that's supposed to be on today uh, to join us. We don't know, but we're glad to have you one way or the other. So welcome to one and all. Uh, I do have a, a few announcements this morning. Uh, you've prob many of you have probably read it in our church newsletter already, but we are preparing for our annual community auction which is one of our large church fundraisers of the year. And this is also an opportunity to, as I like to say, not only raise funds, but raise fun, because it gives us all an opportunity to do social things by donating our, our time and our talents and our services to each other. So I want you to start thinking about what you're going to contribute this year, if you will. And you can go online and do so. There's also online, there's lots of ideas of what some people have done in the past. Uh, just in general, uh, for those who are new to this, this event, there's, you know, they might include social event, events. Some people like to do travel logs of their trips, uh, classes, baked goods, uh, vacation getaway spots, handmade arts and crafts. So, again, lots of ideas, but uh, would really appreciate your kindness and generosity in uh, making our community auction a success. Also, uh, you're going to hear a little bit more about this in a minute, but uh, a reminder that next Sunday at 1230, we're going to have a... It's whose birthday? Charlie's birthday? What do you say? What do you say, Maestro? <laughs> Thank you for telling me. That was a very important announcement, and I would not have wanted to miss that one. All right, some lesser important announcements include the picnic next Sunday at 1230 on our church grounds. Uh, please bring your own food, beverages, plates, utensils, blankets, chairs, and friends. Okay. No, your friends will be here. We'll provide that. So. <laughs> Uh, but because of the pandemic, we're being overly cautious, obviously. And now we are in the midst of, also in the midst of our volunteer fair, in which we are asking folks to consider how they might um, 
share their, their time and expertise in service to the church and, and what opportunities are available. So we're going to uh, explore, uh, particularly this morning, some of the opportunities available in our religious education work with our religious education specialist, Stephanie Gronholz. Good morning. I want to start by recognizing that today is Grandparents Day. How many of you saw that on your calendars? Yeah. So it was established in 17, sorry, 1979 by a woman in West Virginia named Marion McQuaid. And it's a day to celebrate the special role that grandparents play in our children's lives. President Jimmy Carter's official proclamation is worth reading, I think. He said, Grandparents are our continuing tie to the near past, to the events and beliefs and experiences that so strongly affect our lives and the world around us. Whether they are our own or surrogate grandparents who fill some of the gaps in our mobile society, our senior generation also provides our society a link to our national heritage and traditions. We all know grandparents whose values transcend passing fads and pressures, and who possess the wisdom of distilled pain and joy. Because they are usually free to love and guide and befriend the young without having to take daily responsibility for them, they can often reach out past pride and fear of failure and close the space between generations. When you look around our congregation, uh, it's safe to assume that there are some grandparents among us, both biological and spiritual. And so for your grace and wisdom and friendship, we thank you. As Todd has said before, the demographic makeup of this church is not unique. In fact, according to the Legacy Project, there are more grandparents today than ever before. By the year 2030, one in every five Americans will be over 65 years of age. For the first time in history, and probably for the rest of human history, people age 65 and older will outnumber children under age five. What an amazing opportunity this presents us for intergenerational relationships. And here's my plug for that picnic next Sunday. It really is for families of all ages and configurations. So bring your, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren. Um, in addition to enjoying your own food out on the lawn, there's going to be what I call a scavenger hunt, but my son Max calls it an escape room. It's a chance to uh, unlock some clues and explore our seven UU principles and also um, discover some of the really unique gems in our backyard. So back to the service fair. As you know, uh, supporting the spiritual growth of our children, youth, and families is vital to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane's shared ministry. We can do this through multi-generational activities, like the picnic, as well as through programs that are designed specifically for children and youth. Currently, we offer a children's chapel each Sunday morning during the second service, and we would love your help. There's no prep required. You will just escort the children after the time for all ages, help them with our activity for the day, engage in some reflective conversations, and help clean up. We even have a Capri Sun and a cookie for you. <laughs> Do you have a special talent or a skill? that you'd like to share with our children and youth? We would love to learn from you. Our curriculum is flexible enough, and we're open to bringing back programs or establishing new ones, but we can't do that without your help. The Unitarian Universalist seven principles and six sources are at the heart of our, our children's programming. Our mission is to give our children and youth and their families the tools to move through this world with compassion, with integrity, and with the ability to think critically. If you would like to help us enact this mission, please let me know. You can find me after the service. You can, okay, I wrote sign up on the clipboard out there. There's not actually a clipboard. So find me after the service, or you can email me at the address that's in your bulletin. Thank you, and happy Grandparents Day. Thank you, Stephanie, and again for your your enthusiasm and for your expertise and for your not only fondness of 
children, but also of their grandparents. That's, uh, that's great because uh, we are the fastest growing demographic on the planet is 65 year olds. And so uh, we are becoming an, an, an aging species, if you will. And I have never appreciated the, the gray hair talk, you know, that you often get in churches. And it happens all the time. These are an awful lot of folks with gray hair here, you know. Yeah, that's right. But you know what? Your life, our life is precious. It's filled with vibrancy. It's filled with excitement and enthusiasm for living. And that's what this community is about. It's about providing that support and that opportunity for everyone at any age. And we're, 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 only, grow, we're only growing younger at this point. So, 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 so happy Grandparents' Day and senior citizens and everything else. And little ones who are having their first birthdays too. <laughs> Takes all kinds to make a world, right? Okay, what were we gonna do? Oh, greet one another. Yeah, let's take a few moments to greet one another. Please, please say hi to some old friends, make some new friends. If you're joining us for the first time, we're glad you're here, don't be shy. You did good. You did good. All right. Thank you very much. And do stay around after our service for social hour and some warm coffee and tea as well. But let's move forward now by lighting our chalice. The chalice is the symbol of our faith. It is a symbol of our unity and our solidarity, of our openness and our inclusion, of our community and our individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. 
May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need, and may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever it's been found. Our morning reflection today is brought to you by one of my favorite mystic leaders is Joan Borshenko. It is humbling to recognize our minds are quite like an iceberg. Most of their substance is hidden beneath the surface. We typically look for wisdom from God or some other source for solutions to our problems in the visible, logical level of life, missing the real sphere of action. Perhaps you remember the story of a drunk, and he was searching for his keys under a street lamp. A good Samaritan stopped by to help and asked, well, where did you exactly lose these keys? And the drunk pointed out to the vacant lot over there. Well, why are you looking here under the lamp? And the drunk replied with perfect logic, because the light is better here. Our second hymn of the morning is uh, usually associated with our partner church and the Sunday that we uh, celebrate that relationship. But it is also just a wonderful hymn, and I love especially for this service the second verse. So please rise as you're willing and able to sing number 352, Find a Stillness. It's now time to kindle our candles of care for those who are most on our hearts and minds. I do not have any specific names to mention this morning, but I do invite you to go into a moment of silence on behalf of those you might be thinking of, and as always, you're welcome, them to, welcome to name them aloud at this time if you wish. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering in our world at this hour, 
we hold in our community with compassion. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering, which sustains this community and its mission to the larger world. to read your story. So if you want to come closer, you can. You don't. Perfect. Yes. Right where you can see me from right there, okay? Because I brought a friend and I want you to be able to see my 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 friend you. He does he have a funny voice? He does, yes. You've met him before, right? You've met him. Now, now let's, there you go, there you go. Okay, we're going to introduce them to everybody else now, okay? Where they can see him, too. So this is my friend, Noth. Some of you may remember Noth from, yeah, he's, he's welcome to stand where he wants, but you're his parents, you. There he is. Okay, so, so here's the story, okay? I'm reading the story right now. And you can pay attention or not. But this happens to be <laughs> not from the planet Noth. Some of you may have remember meeting Noth for the first time a month or so ago. How's it been going, Not? Greetings, Earthlings. Or as we like to say on Noth. Oh, yes, the last time you were here, you told us that Everything you do on your planet is actually the opposite of what we do on ours. That is correct. We don't go to school until we are old. We let dinner get cold before we eat it. And we always drink coffee before we go to sleep. Well, that is definitely the opposite of what we do. You also told us that the Nothling language is completely meaningless. Yes. On earth you use words to express meaning, 
on not words mean nothing. Okay. Well, uh, strange as that seems, you, you uh, also told us that there are never any wars on your planet. Is that correct? Since nobody ever said anything meaningful, we never had any disagreements. <laughs> well, <laughs> that makes sense, but you, it seems like you're speaking in the, in the past tense. So have, uh, have things changed on Noth since, uh, since you were last here? After visiting your planet, I decided to return to Noth and say something meaningful. I see. Well, what did you say? I told them I like Star Trek better than Star Wars. Wow, ah, and what was their response? We've been fighting ever since. <laughs> well, uh, fighting over a TV show, that sounds pretty, pretty, pretty terrible. And I, I imagine with your superior technology, war, war can actually be pretty devastating on your planet. We don't have any weapons on Noth. No weapons. Well, that's, that's good. Uh, how do you fight your wars? We call each other names. Oh. Okay, well that doesn't sound so bad. You should hear some of the names. Yeah, just yesterday a Star Wars fan called me a... Well, uh, I don't understand Nothling, but that, that doesn't sound so bad. It's okay, because I called her a... Wow, well again, I don't know what any of that means, but it, it sounds kind of harsh. Yes, mother said it was uncalled for. Your mother, so you and your mother are actually calling each other names at this point. Sadly, she has chosen Star Wars over Star Trek, which all sentient beings know is the greatest TV show in the galaxy. Well, I would agree with that, but uh, calling people names just because they, they think differently really isn't necessary, right guys? We shouldn't call people names because they think differently than us. It's not necessary. It's not no, it's not. Who's there? I, d I did not say knock, knock. I said it's not, not. <laughs> Good, because we don't laugh at jokes on knock. You don't laugh at jokes. No, we cry. Uh, the opposite, of course. Well, war is not really a, a laughing matter, and, and even if it is just a war of calling each other names. So, People have all sorts of differences, which you're going to have to learn to deal with if you're going to continue having meaningful conversations. Did, did, did he just call me a name? No. It is a funny sound. I, I think you called me a name, but listen, not. If you want to say something really meaningful, you should go back to your planet and tell your people that there's no sense calling each other names over differences of opinions. There's quite enough room in the galaxy for people who love Star Trek and Star Wars. As lots of well, well as other differences too, right? Since you took it that way, I'd like to take back what I just said. Well, what did you just say? Oh, that, it's okay, I was not offended in the least. So, please go back to Noth and make peace after all, I actually feel a little bit responsible for the war since it was me who encouraged you to start saying meaningful things. Yes, my people also blame you. <laughs> they do? Yes, they call you a... <laughs> okay, well please give them my apologies and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Bye, and we'll sing our children out. Let's use this time to move into a moment of meditation, and it comes from our gray hymnal, actually, number 706. You don't have to read it, I'll read it to you, though. May the light around us guide our footsteps and hold us fast to the best and the most righteous that we seek. 
May the darkness around us nurture our dreams and give us rest so that we may give ourselves to the work of our world. Let us seek to remember the wholeness of our lives, the weaving of light and shadow in this great and astonishing dance which, in which we move. For our reading today, I am going to invite you to open your gray hymnal and join me in reading number 662. Number 662, back of your gray hymnal. And I will begin today and ask the entire congregation to be our respondents. The years of all of us are short, our lives precarious. Yet we find time for bitterness, for petty treason and evasion. Here we are, all of us, all upon this planet, bound together in a common destiny. Kindred in this, each lighted by the same precarious, flickering flame of life, how does it happen that we are not kindred in all things else? I wanted to say a couple words before we hear our musical interlude today. Um, you will hear a recording, like you did for the offertory, which is quite unusual. We usually don't go to recordings. But this recording was a gift from Paul Grove, who is the uh, guitar head of the guitar department at Gonzaga. And he encouraged me to use it if I wanted to in services. And I thought it fit today. Um, the Music you'll be hearing next is actually the creation of three people, and one was long dead when the collaboration happened. Um, Paul Grove, this is a, a guitar piece that call, Paul Grove wrote, and it is, uh, he has written a fugue uh, as, as if he might have been copying uh, J.S. Bach in terms of using the fugue as a form, so that's Bach. And the tune is by Stevie Wonder. And um, I just thought this was a wonderful uh, creative amalgam to listen to. See if you can figure out the tune, which Stevie Wonder tune this might be.
Thank you, Devin. Thanks to Paul, Paul Grove. I definitely caught the Bachian influence, but I'm not familiar enough with Stevie Wonder. Did anybody, anybody, don't tell us yet. I want to, what was it? You are the sunshine of my life. Yeah? Bravo. Bravo. Very good. Yes. You got it too, Joy? No, you didn't. Okay. Wow. Forever you'll be in my heart's the next line. Great. Well, thank you for that. And we'll thank Paul in person the next time we see him. How many of you are familiar with Philip Pullman's award-winning book series, His Dark Materials? Yeah, a few, yeah. So it's about a parallel world that is uh, very much like our own world, but it's strictly controlled by an authoritarian church called the Magisterium. And in this world, everybody is born with and accompanied throughout their lives by an anim animal companion that reflects their innermost nature. These animals can speak and offer guidance to the individuals that they are attached to. And they are called demons. From the Latin and Greek words, diamond and daemon, meaning deity or genius. But are better translated, perhaps, to mean guiding spirit or guardian angel if we were to understand what they meant to the, what to the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks did not think of demons as evil spirits, but as some sort of invisible guide each of us is born with, a lesser spirit, a smaller divinity, to help us divine the path we are upon. Nowadays we might just call it a conscience, or passion, or a sense of purpose. In his book, The Soul's Code, psychologist James Hillman says, the Greeks believe that the soul of each of us is given a unique diamond, is how he says it, before we are born, and it has selected an image or pattern that we live on earth. In this sense, he says, your diamond is the carrier of your destiny. So we won't go into the philosophical question of whether or not there is such a thing as destiny to begin with. For the thought that each of us is accompanied or possessed by a demon need not sound any more magical than it ought to be frightening. The Greeks were merely giving a name to something humans commonly experience that we are nowadays satisfied to give names like conscience and drive and passion and purpose and intuition and instinct. We might also call this demon distinction, originality, exceptionalism, or just plain individuality. It is no wonder the ancient Greeks who recognized this individual spark, the thing that makes each of us unique, are also those who gave us the principles of reason and freedom and tolerance that would become the foundations of our modern democracy and belief that every individual counts and ought to be free to express, them, express themselves and pursue their own purposes. In fact, the Roman word for this phenomenon is genius, referring to original thinking, thinking for ourselves. It also shares the same root is the words gene and genetic. Genius, pronounced genie in Arabic, described as a guiding spirit among the ancients, is nowadays described as genetic code. And thanks to the sexual reproduction, the genetic code is expressed slightly unique in each one of us. In this sense, the Greeks were right. Each of us is born with our own genius, the thing that makes us unique, that helps determine who we are going to become. 
Genius and genetics also share the same root as Genesis, which refers to our origins or to our originality, that which begins within us. So by now you should be seeing the picture that the original idea of demons and demon possession was not horrifying as it is today, but something that referred to our originality, to our genius, to the uniqueness of each person. This is the origin of the Renaissance and Enlightenment principles that gave birth to both our modern notion of worth and dignity of every person and again our idea of democracy, that because everybody has worth, they should have equal footing in society and an equal say in how we are governed. So, what the hell happened? <laughs> Pun intended to make our demons the stuff of nightmares and horror stories. In Philip Pullman's alternate reality, this is the direct fault of an authoritarian church that seeks to restrain individual expression and divergence from its sanctioned norms. In his dark materials, the magisterium is behind the abduction of children whom it experiments on in an attempt to successfully separate them from their demons without actually killing them. This painful procedure described as, in terms of as cutting and tearing them apart, is called intercision. And the separation from one's demon normally in this world means the immediate death of both. But through these cruel experiments, the church found a means of allowing the individual to go on living once separated from their demon, though with no reason or wish to go on living. They become solemn, sickly, hollow inside. As Pullman writes, a human being with no demon was like someone without a face, or with their ribs laid open and their heart torn out. Something unnatural and uncanny that belonged to the world of night gassed, not the waking world of sense. The metaphor is obvious here. The demon in Pullman's story is analogous to the human soul, or, if that word is still too esoteric, let's just use the Greek word for soul, psyche, or suke. These authoritarian forces that seek to get us under control beginning in childhood, be they religious, governmental, or social, can have a devastating psychological impact, disconnecting us from our own authenticity, from others, and from our entire world in the process. In his dark materials, the force that connects us to others and to the world and to all that exists is a mysterious substance. It's called dust, the thing that the authorities most dread. When Lyra, the story's young protagonist, confronts a woman who works for the magisterium about this cruelty, the woman tries to reassure her with these words. Darling, no one would ever dream of performing an operation on the child without testing it first. And no one in a thousand years would take a child's demon away altogether. All that happens is a little cut, and then everything's peaceful. Forever. You see, your demon's a wonderful friend and companion when you're young, but at the age we call puberty, the age you're coming into very soon, darling, Demons bring all sorts of troublesome thoughts and feelings, and that's when the dust gets in. A quick little operation before that, and you'll never be troubled again. And your demon stays with you, only you're just not connected. Like a, like a wonderful pet, if you like. The best pet in the world. Wouldn't you like that? If there is truth to this metaphor, and I think there is, it also explains why one of the most terrifying horror films in history, The Exorcist, is also about a little girl thought to be possessed by an evil demon. She, like Jesus, was even accused of being possessed by 
Beelzebul, the devil himself, the ruler of demons. And what evidence is there that 12-year-old child, Reagan McNeil, also on the cusp of adulthood, is actually possessed by the devil? What is the evidence for this? Well, she urinates on the floor. She throws tantrums. She talks back to adults. She doesn't like going to church. And she spits up her split pea soup. That's pretty much it. In other words, she's acting like a child, a child, albeit in exaggerated ways, to make the film seem more terrifying. Yet it's still something to ponder that a child behaving like a child has become the most horrifying monster in Hollywood history. Talk about projecting the fears of the status quo of the authorities in our lives who want to get us under control as early as possible before we can grow up and rebel, before that playful pup can grow into a lone wolf. We have to be made afraid of disobeying before it becomes too late. That's why The Exorcist is so terrifying, because as kids we were taught that being authentic, having our own authentic beliefs, questioning the authorities in our lives, talking back means punishments. Punishments like rejection, being left out, losing the approval and the love of others. And being alone and left out terrifies us most of all. Freedom and belonging exist at best in constant tension. And being social animals dependent upon the companionship of others and the safety of community, most of us are willing to sacrifice freedom in order to belong. But in doing so, we can lose our own authenticity, the cutting away of our demon. As social psychologist Eric Fromm says, we choose to succumb to authoritarianism with one aim in mind, to get rid of the individual self, to lose oneself. In other words, to get rid of the burden of freedom. Children who disobey remind us of what might have happened to us if we had not allowed the authorities to guide and shape us instead of trusting the demon we are born with. We might think the belief in evil demons and demon possession is a medieval madness, but Americans found The Exorcist so terrifying that after its release in 1973, the number of exorcisms conducted in the U.S. rose 50%. And today, 70% of Americans believe in the devil and demon possession. In 1975, just two years later, James Busoto published an article about several alleged cases of what he called cinematic neurosis, where after viewing The Exorcist, people believed that they were possessed by the devil. These numbers indicate that many in our society are terrified of demons and demon possession, which, as we have seen, etymologically means they are terrified of their own authenticity, of pursuing their own meaning and purpose that they were born to fulfill before the magisterium intercised or exercised their demons. In so doing, sadly, tragically, they are then doomed to fail at life itself, at least if what Fromm says is true, that the whole meaning of life is to develop into the individual one potentially is. That the duty to be alive is the same as the duty to become oneself. We have come to fear being possessed by demons rather than not being possessed by them. What happened to my demon? We're not afraid, that is, of living a wasted, inauthentic life. Rather, we dread the possibility of reuniting with the guardian angel that accompanied us into this world, the, the genie who was present at our genesis, the genes that make us holy 
unique as individuals, the unencumbered psyche, the free spirit, whatever you want to call it. We should fear failing in our duty to ourselves to become authentic persons free to speak for ourselves and think for ourselves and act for ourselves. Of course, doing so is easier said than done. We grow to fear freedom and authenticity more than almost anything else. Many would rather watch the entire world burn than to defy the status quo, which is literally happening today. They will deny the truth that is not only staring them in the face, but that is punching them in the face. If that's what it takes to belong, to be included, to feel secure, we'll accept almost anything short of becoming demonized by others, or in modern parlance, canceled, We're demonized when society sees that we are animated by our own volition. That there are no puppet masters pulling our strings. That's what gets us canceled. Animate comes from the Greek word meaning soul. Anima. Just as spirit comes from the words meaning breath and wind as an in inspiration. These, like the demon, are invisible forces that move us and make us alive, not external authorities that tell us what to do. This, I would suggest, is why so many found the exorcist so horrifying, because going along with the authorities, with the status quo, with a society that doesn't tolerate differences, differentiation, or dissension, frightens us. As an audience, by and large, we took the side of the magisterium. We were terrified audiences that demonized that child, that demonized that little girl. And degree that she needed to undergo an exorcism, an intercism, a cutting, a tearing away of her demon so that it will no longer possess her. And she will be left empty and shallow and go on living an inauthentic and unfulfilling life. As they say, the authorities say in 1984, we shall squeeze you empty and then we will fill you with ourselves. The belief in demons is but a projection of our own fear upon others. There may be no such thing as demon possession, at least not in the horrific Hollywood sense, but there are plenty of people who have been demonized by a society of emptied individuals who are terrified of becoming truly free because becoming truly free risk becoming truly alone, not only without companionship but also without security and the opportunities society provides. These are real fears. There are real consequences. To risk being free means risking one's well-being as well as one's livelihood. So we would rather join the demonizers than be ranked among the demonized. Yet our lives are never purely one way or the other. It is not as if there are some people who are entirely social and others, a few, who are entirely free. Finding the right balance, a healthy balance between those most basic yet divergent of human needs is the dance we do, the struggle we must or at least should be engaging in. If we aren't, then we are most likely to have given up on freedom and thus on our own authenticity altogether. For freedom is always a struggle to achieve and can only be partially experienced and then only for short periods. Because we are ultimately creatures that exist in relationship to others and to our environment. If we choose not to engage in this struggle, then it is always easier to choose belonging by surrendering our ability to think and speak and act of our own volition. Those who fall into this class, and there are far more of them than not, 
have been tricked and trick themselves into thinking that they are authentically thinking and speaking and acting. But they only parrot the party line of whatever group they have sacrificed so much to belong to. Nowadays, they only repeat what they hear on faux news or BSNBC and what they've read on social media or have been steered toward by computer algorithms designed to keep their attention rather than the royal decrees and religious dogmas issued in the past. But this has always been so, the idea that every individual has worth and dignity and therefore ought to be free and have a choice in how one is governed is a relatively new idea. It is far from dominant in the world. Only recently I was speaking with a man from India who argued that individuality is an illusion that we are all one and exist only in relationship. And as a student of both mysticism and Eastern philosophy, I understand where he's coming from, but as a product of Western society and a student of its philosophy, I do not wholly agree. In our Western individualistic society, we're likely to introduce ourselves by talking about what we do for a living or what we do for fun. But in societies that are more collectivistic, individuals are more likely to introduce themselves by saying what group or clan or tribe they are a part of. The idea that every individual counts, though pondered at times throughout human history, didn't begin to take root until the 19th century towards the end of the Enlightenment, which led to concepts like the rights of man and democracy. As political economist Francis Fukuyama says, this is when societies that once only recognized an elite few were replaced by ones that recognized everyone as inherently equal. So the idea of individualism and free societies is still budding and still resisted by our species of ape that has long looked toward the authoritarian silverback to tell us what to do and how to think and what to, what to say. This to me is what makes our Western culture so unique. It's struggle to fashion successful individualistic societies based on freedom and mutual respect and cooperation. So far we have to give this endeavor mixed reviews. For some, freedom means being entirely self-centered, even at the expense of others, which manifest as things like not wanting to pay our fair share of the taxes, or having to adhere to, not wanting to adhere to regulations requiring us to care for the well-being, at least consider for the well-being of others in the environment and the pursuit of our own interests or getting vaccinated in order to end a pandemic threatening us all. But this is a rather childish idea of freedom that comes from a narcissistic sense of privilege, not from the recognition of individual worth and dignity, which leads to our belief in freedom, to our commitment to freedom. Free people don't abuse their freedoms by doing things that disregard the rights and welfare of others. Free people desire to be free because they believe in individual worth and thus in the freedom of others above all else. And so this fledgling experiment still seeks for its roots to take firm hold and for it to truly grow and to flourish upon the earth. But for this to ever happen, more of us must find the courage to be free. And from this, the desire for all persons to be genuinely free. Instead of demonizing those who speak, speak and think and act freely, we must encourage and celebrate their uniqueness, their ingenuity, their genetics, their genies, their demons. Instead of working on behalf of the magisterium to perform intercisions and, intercisions and exorcisms, to cut and tear and separate our children from discovering and fulfilling their own purposes. 
We must encourage them and nourish them in the process of fully unfolding. We should teach them to respect their freedom and to respect the freedoms of others, but not to fear freedom or to fear the freedom of others. And as adults who were once children ourselves and had our own demons exercised to various degrees, we should ponder our relation now with freedom as we continue to unfold into the uniquely individualistic, authentic, people that we are. Thank you. Our closing hymn is, Oh, What a Piece of Work Are We, number 313. And it, the words were written by Melvina Reynolds, who I believe died in 1978. She wrote lots of interesting songs. She was quite an individual herself. She wrote the tune Little Boxes, which some of you may remember. So please rise, uh, as you are willing and able, to sing, Oh, What a Piece of Work Are We. Our closing words comes from someone who I think most of us are familiar with, Alan Alda. At times, you may have to leave the city of your comfort and go into the wilderness of your intuition. What you'll discover will be wonderful. What you'll discover is yourself. Amen, blessed be, salam alaikum, and shalom.